Welcome to the Real Estate Espresso Podcast, your morning shot of what's new in the world of real estate investing. For Thursday, August 25th, I'm your host, Victor Manash. Today and every day this week, we're looking at some aspect of global food security, major shifts that are putting enormous strain on our global food supply. We're already experiencing acute shortages all over the world. If you like chicken, well, don't try and order it in a restaurant in Singapore. If you like Dijon mustard, don't try and buy it in France. There's none on the shelves. For Monday's show, we talked about how dietary preferences have increased the demand for grain on a global basis, as more and more people shift from plant-based diets to consuming more animal protein. On Tuesday's show, we talked about how more and more farmland is being diverted from food production for growing biofuels like ethanol and biodiesel. On Wednesday's show, we talked about how energy markets are affecting the supply of fertilizer and how fertilizer use is down 5% so far this year, and that's expected to have an immediate 2% decrease in food yield on a global basis. On today's show, we're taking a look at what happens when there are food shortages. We start to see the rise of food nationalism. This is just human behavior. We saw it, for example, during the pandemic. All it took was the perception of a shortage of toilet paper, and people started hoarding toilet paper. The shelves in the grocery store were emptied of toilet paper. Supply didn't really change, and consumption didn't really change at the point of use. And yet, all it took was a bit of hoarding mentality for the shelves to be emptied. Same thing is happening on a global scale with food nationalism. The last time we saw this on a large scale was back in the 1970s. It's a phenomenon that has plenty of historic precedents. Today, we already have about 20% of the world's food supply under some kind of export restriction. There's numerous examples. Now, some countries produce far more than they need domestically to serve their population. And other countries have very little in the way of domestic production of certain foods, and they rely almost entirely on imports for their daily food. A case in point is Malaysia, which has halted its chicken exports in an effort to safeguard its domestic supply which leaves Singapore struggling to find chicken as authorities have suggested the public offer frozen poultry instead. This move also follows India's banning of wheat exports, Indonesia blocking its palm oil exports. India is the second largest wheat producer in the world, and it's halted wheat exports in a ban that will further strain global wheat supply. Parts of East Africa are already experiencing food shortages as a result of that ban. India is a total powerhouse when it comes to producing wheat, and they export wheat historically to 68 countries. It's also one of the cheapest global suppliers. Export bans, higher tariffs, and other barriers have been imposed on 17% of international food market on a caloric basis as of the end of June. That's according to a tracker maintained by the International Food Policy Research Institute headquartered in Washington. These export restrictions have become particularly prominent for categories of food produced in large quantities by both Russia and the Ukraine. Wheat is subject to restrictions by 13 countries, the highest count for any single agricultural product. Corn is the next most restricted product, with 10 countries having export bans. We also have food shortages for specific crops. For example, if you were to travel to France right now, you would find store shelves completely empty of Dijon mustard. There's not a single jar of mustard for sale in the entire country. Even if there's no formal export ban, there can still be shortages. For example, I can easily buy Dijon mustard in Canada. Canada is one of the largest producers of mustard seed in the world, but I can't buy it in France. And many of the world's best-known mustard brands are owned by Unilever. Are they simply shipping mustard to those locations that attract the highest price? We don't know the answer. I just know that France has no mustard. The world's largest supplier of sunflower oil historically has been the Ukraine. The sunflower crop simply did not get planted this year because of the war. That's going to lead to a global shortage in cooking oil within the next year. Some countries produce wheat, barley, rice, and corn, and others simply cannot. They don't have the right growing condition. When countries start to institute export bans, you now create situations where some countries lose their primary supply, and in some cases their only supply for that food product. We're not talking about banning luxury items like cars or brands of clothing. We're talking about threatening the lives of entire countries. We've experienced resource wars throughout history. The 20th century, and arguably even this century, has seen plenty of war linked to resources like energy and oil. Food wars are also a distinct possibility if people become desperate. A 5% decline in food production could threaten starvation for up to 400 million people a year. That could create conditions that, frankly, within the next decade could result in resource wars over food. 
We keep hoping that things will return to normal, that supply chain shortages will resolve themselves and that interest rates will fall to the intoxicating levels we've enjoyed for the past decade. But I'm seeing simply too many structural issues that are betting against the supply side returning to normal. We have a growing population of 8 billion people living on a resource-constrained planet. There have been various studies suggesting the planet could support a population of 10 billion, but I believe we're going to start to see the limits of our planet long before we hit that 10 billion mark. We don't know if the current wave of food nationalism is merely a temporary aberration or if it's an early warning sign of more major disruptions to come. I believe that as real estate investors, we've got the opportunity to help what is shaping up to be a real problem. Our growing season is too short for some crops, and the best way to lengthen the growing season in some climates that are not suited to certain crops is to build greenhouses. We see them used routinely in cold climates like Canada for cucumbers and tomatoes and red peppers. We have so many things impacting the production of food right now, whether it's higher energy prices, impacting the supply of fertilizer, the removal of millions of acres from food production in favor of biofuels, and increased demand for animal protein, which is putting a tremendous amount of strain on our agricultural systems. With these shortages, food nationalism is an absolute certainty, and we're already seeing it. This is our time as entrepreneurs, as business people, as real estate investors to solve some of the biggest problems on the planet. As you think about that, have an awesome rest of your day. Go make some great things happen. We'll talk to you again tomorrow.